Hey, everybody, welcome to this episode of Thinking Christian. I'm here with Lee Humarian, and we are going to talk a little bit about his life and uh, and what him, what brought him to ministry. Uh, Lee and I actually just met formally a few weeks ago while I was over in the Czech Republic teaching a class for Wheaton College. Lee is in one of those classes, and we had the opportunity just to talk, but I was really fascinated by uh, his life story as well as his work in Ukraine as a missionary. And so we're going to be talking about that today on the episode. And uh, welcome, Lee. Thanks for coming. Um, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? And um, I'll, I'll pepper in some questions, but tell us about your journey. What brought you to Ukraine? Um, you know, just give us the story. Absolutely, man. James, thanks so much for having me. It's a real, real treat for me to be here. Ukraine became part of our story, my wife and I. Uh, our story in 2014. So my wife was working at a church doing youth ministry, and that church would send uh, short-term teams to Ukraine every summer doing English camps, um, leading uh, with an organization called Josiah Venture, which is the organization that we work for now. And we, she got the job and then was tasked with leading this trip and had never seen it done before because she had just, it was a new job for her. So we came here in 2014 and Three days after the Maidan revolution is actually when we landed here. So we kind of saw, you know, Ukraine in a, in a different a different light than it typically had been up to that point. Um, kind of that was what really sparked a, a new revolution and kind of ousted a Putin puppet president. And obviously that was the beginning of the the original start of the the, the Ukraine war with Russia. And um. We when was that about, Lee, just fight. to give people a little bit on the history? When was that? What year? Somewhere yeah, so in 2014, 2014 uh, when okay. Russia yeah, initially uh, annexed Crimea and um, kind of started, they invaded in the Donbass region, uh, which is, again, currently occupied. And that that conflict, um, you know, unfortunately, Crimea is still under Russian occupation and... Okay. But in the Donbas region, a lot of the military like flee. There was just one day where they just dropped their guns and left in, in, in that same year of 2014. And so there was kind of this stalemate for years and years and years until the escalated invasion, um, you know, uh, back in February 24, 2022. Yeah. So that was our first exposure to Ukraine. And we, it was a high school team. So it was me, my wife four other leaders and at 20 high schoolers. So of, of course, parents weren't really thrilled with the idea of us <laughs> taking a team of high schoolers to uh, a country that was uh, in war. And at that point, you know, obviously, you know, the fog of war, you know, at that you know, the internet was right. just not really a thing. Like right, to be right. able, you couldn't really check in to see like what's going on and understand kind of the, the scale of everything. And so parents didn't, did not want us coming here, understandably. <laughs> so we ended up going to the Czech Republic, doing an English camp there. Um, and just really fell in love with the Josai Venture model for for camps and the Josai Venture model for using um, short term teams. I think, you know, some missions organizations. I don't know. I've been on I've been on trips that have been fruitful where you know we've done different things like construction pro projects or um, things of that nature, which I think are a good thing. Josai Venture uses American teams and has uses European teams as well to just be a bridge between the local church and non-believing campers. Okay. And so it was really cool to just kind of be a, a catalyst and see how this, this kind of discipleship movement works. You know, it was, it's small scale discipleship ministry that, you know, we got to be a part of and see uh, firsthand. And so we also, my wife and I felt kind of guilty about ditching Ukraine and not actually coming. We had visited Ukraine on a pre-trip just to kind of meet the missionaries, see what we'd be doing. So in 2016, we came back, led a, a music and arts camp or helped helped a local church lead a music and arts arts camp, and then the organization just having to Ukraine invited us to come uh, launch, like be a part of their full time staff and launch a, a kind of a music and preventative lecture program to schools. It's like this live concert slash lecture program. Okay. Um, it's like I think the Dare program just on steroids with a live concert element. So I have a a music background. My wife has a youth ministry background, so it was just kind of this strange kind of perfect fit for the two of us to be able to like utilize things that we both love um, and for, for uh, you know, God's movement here in Ukraine. So that wasn't, we got back to the States, August, 2016, prayed and fasted, sought, sought counsel. I mean, never, never 
thought about being full-time missionaries ever. Yeah. It was never on yeah. our radar. So 2016 um, was still a short term, right? Because that would have been yeah, that was post just, high yeah, school. Weeks. And you were in you were in college, correct? Exactly. So I okay. had I graduated uh, two thousand nine. So I was just I was touring in a metal band for I it was like I started full time in twenty twelve, and you know was still doing that at the time. We we visited Ukraine, had to get a fill and drummer for that summer um, to go on that trip, but okay. that was August twenty sixteen. We felt confirmation, filled out an application August fifteenth, moved. June of 15th the next year. So it was like 10 months later wow. when we, we got here. It was really fast. Like our lives just totally flipped upside down. And Katie got pregnant and we had our first kid in June <laughs> the following year. So like literally in the span of two years, our lives totally were on a, just <laughs> yeah. a new trajectory. It's pretty wild. So and, and we've I been did, here ever since know, we've been here. Yeah. I'd mentioned, you know, uh, one of my buddies who helps me out with this, Nate, um, he was big in the music industry. He worked for K-Love and did a, he's done uh-huh. a few other things. He was big in the skate scene um, as well. And so um, I mentioned Phineas to him. So you were part of, you mentioned you were part of a, a metal band, Phineas, oh, right? Yeah. And so oh, he's yeah, like- nine years of my life, yep. He's like, yeah, absolutely. I know Phineas. So he was excited that I was going to be talking to you today. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nathan, thanks for the love, man. <laughs> they're they're still going they played japan in march and i was a little jealous but you know I, we still we all stay in touch and and uh yeah they're good they're good men it was nine years of my life you know uh yeah. seven you know five of which living in a van you know with these guys so you get pretty close <laughs> it's in, tight quarters in many ways yeah. you know yeah you know, after, after that so so talk a little bit about i mean you you know that's a that is a quick turnaround brother i mean 20 yeah. months uh, to go from, you know, living in the States, um, doing your thing, moving over to Ukraine and then having a kid. Right. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit about your ministry there up to um, this latest escalation and kind of what you were doing, you know, what your full time role was kind of in between these two periods when you moved and then when the Ukraine conflict started here uh, mm-hmm. most recently. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we moved to launch uh, in Ukraine this ministry called Exit, which is kind of a, it's a music outreach program that uses preventative lectures to connect uh, churches with teenagers in public schools. Okay. And so it's, it, it, it's, it was, it's awesome. And uh, it was yeah. something that I got to use kind of uh, some of my artist relations background and just tech background and stuff. We put on this huge concert in the morning at a school. So imagine, I mean, you're, you're, if you're a you know a, a junior high kid or a high school kid, you come to school one day, all of a sudden your gym is just got the stage and lights and you know it's backdrop and there's just artists performing, you know it's just okay this is going to be not a normal day of school and that's totally what it was. We right. would just we would the school would give us the whole day. We would do kind of this opening program with concert and kind of an interactive element for preventative lectures. So we would do we would lecture on things like from you know personality helping kids understand, you know, who they are, telling them about their brain, how they're wired. Um, We would do um, lectures on bullying and things like this, preventative lectures, but also kind of developmental lectures as well. Um, And it was something, it was something really powerful. And we did it in, gosh, we did about a half dozen cities in Ukraine. And in in our home city of Lviv, there's about, there's a little over a hundred high schools and we did it in, in over half of them. And so we were able to really get a lot of exposure um, as far as, you know, helping churches. And we would always take a local church team with us. The whole goal of the okay. week was to kind of use the the week of, we would be in four schools during the week. The church would be with us. And one of the lectures was just essentially games, you know, where the church team would be with us. We'd be in the gymnasium playing games with these these young people. And then we'd invite them to an after-school activity, um, which which the church team would, we would equip the church team to, to run. And if they had like okay. a youth group, they would just do something that looked like their typical weekly gathering. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a way to kind of cast a net, you know, so to speak, and get a lot of, of non-believing youth or, you know, seeking youth um, to connected to the event. And then we would equip the church leaders to then reach out, connect with them, invite them to coffee, get to know them. And so it was a, it was kind of a, it was a role, it was a come and see ministry. We would just try to get new people into to youth groups or into you know music groups or sports groups or whatever whatever the ministry was the church was either already doing or going to start doing through through exit so it was kind of a, a this massive bridge 
um, between yeah. schools. And it was a way for us to connect with kids that are, that are going to school. So why not go to them and, and uh, kind of expose them to just a different type of adult, you know, like, yeah, you know, the average Ukrainian young person, I mean, our, we have a, a music ministry at our church here and probably about half the kids come from a broken family. Okay. So they're not seeing, you know, healthy relationships at home. Typically, you know, a lot, there's new teachers coming up the ranks, but teachers that kind of were trained in the Soviet Union, there's, they're, it's very shame based. So, you know, at home, they're not getting, they're receiving much love. Typically at school, they're not receiving love or respect, you know, with their friends, it's debatable. Um, yeah. And so to kind of, for, to expose them to these adults that are just having fun with them, caring about them, asking them the questions, and then they come and get attached to a youth group where, wait, this, there's a whole kind of group that's like this. It was just a, a real way to kind of uh, just really share the love of Christ with young people in a really practical way and get them connected, um, connected to local church leaders that we'd equipped yeah. to hopefully you know pursue them and reach out. So that was what we came to do up until okay. COVID. Our last tour, our last exit, uh, we, uh, exit tour event in Ukraine was October of, of 2019, it would have been. That okay. was our last tour. So how central is the, I mean, you know, you're, you're obviously trying to bridge between public schools, which I think is a great venue if you can get it uh, over in the yeah. church. So how, how central is the church to sort of Ukrainian life? I mean, over in the States, you know, at this point, I would say church is fairly peripheral for most people, you know, it, it's sort of something right. that's there and they, they sort of tolerate it, but it's not a, it's not really a locus for community for a lot of Americans. And so what role does it play in Ukraine? It's a great question. So last year, I actually just looked at these stats uh, in 2022, nice. about 72% of Ukrainians uh, like claimed orthodoxy as their, as their, okay. as their religion. Um, yep. I think it was 9% Catholic and then 2% Protestant. And so, oh, okay. and the more West you get in Ukraine, it was actually more, more religious the farther east okay. there were actually higher a little bit higher numbers not not substantially higher but a fewer few, like i think 10 percent atheists like in eastern ukraine that kind of thing so it's okay highly religious context yeah and so coming for out of the soviet union where i mean even as you see with um you know patriarch kirill over in the moscow um, orthodox church like him not just like condoning but kind of supporting you know uh um, the Kremlin and the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, that's kind of that that is the the history, or at least the 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 history for the parents, the grandparents here in Ukraine is orthodoxy is just kind of a part of life. It's a part of the Ukrainian heritage. And okay. so there are a majority of Ukrainians. Um, I, again, I have nothing against orthodoxy. I think a, a lot of Ukrainians are. Sure. They're, it's it's just very rote. They're going through the motions, kind of doing yeah. their rights, going you know doing these things in order to kind of be clean, in order to do whatever they kind of want, um, you know, the rest of the week. And sure. so, and I think I think I love liturgy, and I think there's a lot to you know um, high church model thing like the things like this. I literally just wrote a paper for the other class I'm in this semester about um, Kirill and Methodius and like this movement. So it's it's all very fresh in my head, but uh, so. The church, you know, in Lviv, especially Lviv is like one of the Western most cities geographically. And also okay. it's one of the most Westernized cities um, in Ukraine, highly religious, um, highly religious population here. And so like on Christmas, people will just, it's common greeting to just say Christ was born today, you know, let's praise him. Or like on Easter in the church on Easter, we would say he is risen, right? Here you yeah. would say it, if I'm getting into a taxi, the driver would be like, he is risen, you know, and he is risen indeed. So it's high, it's a highly religious context. Um, and so people know who Jesus is. They believe in him, um, a majority do, but they don't necessarily belong to a local community. If they go to church, it's okay. kind of, it's a personal thing, right? And then they don't, it hasn't really changed much of their behavior other than, you know, when they're celebrating certain traditions sure. or things like this. So okay. the Protestant church because it's this is changing but even even in the six and a half years that we've been here when we first got here it was like we had to be super careful because the protestant church was views was viewed along the lines of like um um uh, 
kind of like a more like a Mormon church or Jehovah's Witnesses. And so and okay. there's a, a pretty like Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of they're on a lot of corners here. And yeah. so if we were to do some kind of street evangelism as Protestants, we would just be immediately lumped in with Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's so Witnesses, we had to be very yeah. mindful about kind of our strategy. And yeah. even like I remember one one exit event that we did, um, you know, our after school activity was at a church. And so kids, you know, some kids would walk up, see the building and just turn around and leave because they were kind of afraid of like, oh, this cult of Christianity, this this Protestant movement is like yeah. because it's it's only two percent in the country it's still kind of viewed as, as like something to be afraid of. It's changing and young people, I mean, you're thinking, you know, Ukraine received its independence in 91. So young people, like even in their, you know, early thirties, didn't live with that kind of like that oppression. And yeah. so young people are a lot more open, but, you know, we've had young people get connected to our, our ministries and their parents forbid them to attend, or, you know, a young person might repent and believe in Jesus and want to get baptized, but then, you know, the, the parents will say like, no, absolutely not. Like you've been baptized in, you know, the Orthodox church or the Catholic church. And so, um, the church itself is prevalent. Um, but as Protestants, like there was definitely, we had to kind of live in tension, you know, understanding kind of our, you know, what we, our ultimate goal was, but also understanding we, we needed to respect the authority of the school system and being in a public school, we wanted to respect their authority, we would sure. promise, you know, to say like, we're not going to say anything from stage. We're not going to say anything, you know, we're not going to proph prophesize your, your students here sure. in, in the, the school grounds. We're going to invite them to an after school activity. And because what we were offering was so it was high quality and there's, there was nothing else being like typically being offered like that in, in Ukrainian schools, typically even knowing who we were, um, Ukrainian schools would say yes. On, like, again, with the stipulation that we would not, Yeah. You know, publicly do anything you know that would be questionable um yeah. in a public school which i think is understandable so, and reasonable so i mean it would be fair to sort of characterize the orthodox church as the way i think of it it's like the default operating system right and so right. it's it's got its certain functions that it's going to perform but it's not going to perform much more than that and so what sure. parents are really concerned about is um losing that sort of something that has become very much a part of let's say the country's heritage absolutely uh, to a sect right right which in yeah, the united that's states sounds it. weird to kind of think about right <laughs> protestantism yeah. as a sect as opposed to sort of the dominant um religion um but for right. you guys in ukraine it's it's a sect it's it's something that is viewed with a, a great deal of suspicion, not necessarily because of Jesus, right? right. Um, you know, it's it, um, but because you're actually maybe trying to pull people away from something that is really highly valued, absolutely, and, and isn't a bad thing necessarily. But it doesn't seem to me like. Every time I've run across Orthodox churches, um, and I, I obviously I don't have the experience with it, you do, but they don't seem particularly active on the youth side, right? Absolutely They're sure. much more just the, hey, let's do liturgy, we'll do even mm -hmm. song, um, you know, those kind of things, which wouldn't necessarily appeal to youth. Is that Absolutely. a fair characterization? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that is the, that's the thing that is kind of, like you said, it's questionable to maybe even parents to see, wait, what do they want from you then? Like, what's this youth group yeah. thing? What's this music ministry? You're getting free drum lessons? Like what? Like that doesn't make sense. Right. So surely they want your money or something, you know, surely there's some kind of catch. And so sometimes, <laughs> you know, so even, you know, some of the more, you know, uh, open students, let's say, like, they'll just ask right away, like, what do you want from me? You know, like, what, what, like, what's the catch here? You know, and, and just like, <laughs> Dude, no, this is just, we just, we love you and we want you to have a, a safe place for you yeah. to be yourself and get to know this man that we love uh, named Jesus and and uh, have him get to know you as well. He's so, I mean, he already knows you, but, uh, you know, be in relationship with him. And so it there is this sense of, wait, this is something's different. And so, but I, I mean, there, I think those assumptions, once they, once they set foot typically into a ministry and they experience, I mean, once you experience the love of Jesus, I mean, it's like Paul on the road to Damascus, right? I mean, once he experienced that, his life was changed, his life changed forever. Yeah. So I think once you experience that love of Jesus, 
you know, you understand that something is different here. You know, there's this environment, yeah. there's this, this atmosphere that I'm feeling that I don't feel anywhere else. We've had kids that have said they're staunch atheists come to our, our music ministry at our church called fusion for years because they they're like, I feel different here than I feel anywhere else. So yeah. they're, they're, exper- they're they haven't repented and believe in Jesus yet. Um, this, this one kid in particular I'm thinking of, but he still comes because he's experiencing something he hasn't experienced anywhere else whether in the Orthodox church or, you know, in other places. So you're obviously getting, you know, good success with the youth. Do you see a lot of parents sort of embracing it? Uh, I mean, how does that all work? How does that bridge play out? I mean, I love the idea of the public schools and the youth and all that. And then, you know, do you get a lot of, I don't want to say converts, but people pulling over from the Orthodox church to actually be part of your local church communities simply because you're caring for their kids and they appreciate that. There had like, one of the longest running fusions in our in our city of Ukraine. Like they had kind of this reverse thing where their kids repented and believed in Jesus. They became leaders in the in the fusion ministry, hmm. the music ministry, and then they started. Like their parents would get connected. Like there was a there was three moms that repented and believed in Jesus through their their kids, like evangelizing to them. And so it's kind yeah. of this, this really unique uh, flip, which is, I think, pretty beautiful. Can you imagine? Like, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I, I can't imagine being the person that, you know, brings the gospel to my my parents. Um, so it's this really beautiful picture where, like, they actually have their own mission field right at home, you know, with their, yeah. their family and their friends and stuff. And so um, it's not necessarily the most common thing, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I do think that I could think of one of the guys I disciple I, I, he was, he was one of the most skeptic, skeptical people, but he just loved our group. And I would always, he was the first guy I shared the gospel with in Ukrainian. And, uh, it was something like 967 days from when I met him, I actually taught English at his school. That's how he got connected. Then he came to our English club and then he got connected to our music ministry, heard the gospel a bunch of times. And we were actually at home on home assignment when he repented and believed in Jesus. And I was just like, well, man, I couldn't have been there with you. Um, <laughs> yeah. He did. Couldn't he did waited. video chat me that night. Yeah, yeah he couldn't have waited. <laughs> that was there. nice. Yeah. So I was like, all right, it's it's, it's an important decision. You can do it while I'm while I'm gone. But uh, <laughs> but like his mom was just like really afraid, you know, of of and and she's actually she she kind of rejects just religion in general. Um, okay. She would say that there's you know they're in it for the money things like that, and so um, you know a lot of and he he still has doubts, and I I tell him like, dude, brother, that's totally normal, like. Like there, it's just, you know, yeah. it's faith, faith. Yeah. Everybody has, has them. Absolutely. Um, but his mom was definitely pretty afraid at first, kind of like, what are you getting involved in? Yeah. And he's just, be- he's gotten super involved. He became like, he's our, our lighting director at our church. Just, uh, he's like sings on one of our worship teams. You know, he was kind of just all in, you know, yeah. and, um, his mom was really concerned, but I think at, you know, she, our music ministry does concerts at the end of every semester and after the camp. And she would come and attend the concert to watch her son play. And, uh, and that was just kind of get you know, again, going, getting there, hearing us speak, realizing we're not, we're not trying to manipulate. We're not trying to, you know, get money or, you know, I don't know. We're not, we're not doing anything strange. We love Jesus and we love your kid, you know? And so um, I think that, you know, once you have that, those interactions, it just helps, helps them open up. She, I don't think she has attended, I don't think ever, like a service herself. Um, I think she's listened to like our, you know, our our broadcast. Yeah. And then her son has, a lot of the questions her son asks me, like when we uh, spend time together, will be like things that, it's like, is your mom asking you this? And, and <laughs> he is, you know, so, so That's he's trying to be a thing. That's the, not a bad thing. It's not yeah, a bad really thing. Cool. No, and it's, it's yeah. actually a beautiful thing. He has a great relationship with his mom and, uh, yeah. And it's just a really cool thing to see. Like, he has this opportunity to continue to just have, you know, be open and have conversations with her. And so again, it's like like that thing you were speaking of, where he he has this unique. He's found, you know, this treasure, and he's trying to to pass that right. along. And um, she's fairly open to we'll it. See. It sounds like, even though she doubts, she's still open at least to ask the questions. Very cool. Yeah, she's. I mean, she sounds like a, a wonderful mom. Like she yeah. seems she's really cares for for her son. And um, you know, and it's like if you think that there's something like I'm thinking I've two little girls. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. If I thought they were getting involved with something sketchy, 100%. I would also be concerned, you know? So yeah. I think, <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's under, I think it's actually a sign of a good parent if they are, you know, involved and concerned, if they feel like something's off, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, just hearing you describe it, it, it does feel a little different than sometimes what we get in the States. I mean, I've done some, I've done work here in the States in like New England area and different places. And so there seems to be um, more of an antagonism toward Christianity mm-hmm. that is um, rooted in the fact that it just is Christianity. Right. In other words, you know, this is just a bunch of bunk. It's all fake. Um, You know, if if you're not an atheist, you should at least be agnostic. And nobody really knows what this stuff means versus what I hear you describing, which is, no, they've got their tradition. They've got a, Mm -hmm. a tradition rooted in the Orthodox Church. And it just really feels like they're concerned that all of what they value that is probably very good in the Orthodox Church doesn't go away as their kids, you know, sort of as they're passing this on to the next generation, they're just trying to shepherd that well, um, which is a very different problem, right? Hey Amen. It is. Um, it is. And I think because of the internet, things are trickling over a lot quicker now to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's definitely something that, you know, young people are def- are getting exposed to more Western ideas and kind of what's cool, you know, like you said, what it's kind of, if you're not, you know, questioning everything and doing, you know, there's just kind of yeah. this kind of, I, I don't want to say mm, there, there's just kind of some expectations of what you should be thinking. Like what is kind of the high, high way of thinking that is that I've felt when I've been in America, you know, on our home assignments and it's definitely trickling over here a lot faster than it probably was, you know, even five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, there's a, you know, there's a it's, lot it's, there it's, that's probably not we, great to trickle, but <laughs> well some things you know some things trickling over are great great but right yeah unfortunately some things not as not as good not not so good well you know you got us up to covid so um you know your last uh event at the schools was in october 2019 so covid hits you know you sort of have to do something different what did you guys end up doing through covid how did i mean was it lockdowns and shutdowns and all that kind of fun stuff in ukraine too or How did that operate for you all? Ukraine was one of, became one of the most open European countries. Um, And so we were, we were locked. It's hard. Honestly, my memory since the start of the war is really bad. Like that's, it's just fog in there. (laughs) Right. I think it was, it was just, we had a few months of lockdown, not like, you know, not anything super strict. We could go to the grocery store, you know, we could go, you know, to essential places or whatever there, you know, um, take, we could, I remember just doing daily walks. Our, our youngest or our, excuse me, our oldest was, should have been, uh, turning two at the time. And then we were, okay. Katie was pregnant with our second. Um, and so COVID, uh, we kind of just stepped back and tried, uh, you know, just, I've sure tries to be an innovative organization. And I know that was, that was kind of a buzzword during COVID, like innovate, pivot, all those things. So we, you know, we tried to reinvent school ministry. And at that time, I had actually just become, I was the director of uh, the exit school ministry in Ukraine. I had just become the international exit director at that point. Like my first international meeting was like going to be in March of, you know, 20, 2020 or whatever. And so that, that didn't happen. And so um, (laughs) it was just kind of this trying to, trying to step back and say, okay, how do we, how do we kind of support schools? How do we bless teachers? So we would do English lessons online. We would, we actually started, um, through exit we had a great and not just through exit but through like years and years of kind of um really grind work that our uh, one of our co-leaders uh, christy williams did early you know she's they, her and her husband ben have been here they're our team leaders they've been here for 16 years maybe 17 now and so years and years they were just trying to teach english in schools you know get get some grunt work to like literally we had the department of education in lviv asking our organization to equip their teachers with a series, a lecture series. So awesome. during COVID, yeah. we were like doing zoom lectures with, you know, a couple hundred teachers on the zoom. Actually tomorrow I'm, I'm doing a, a lecture. We're, we're continuing that on. So it's still something that post COVID. That's doing, great. Yeah. Still a zoom thing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do a, a lecture on the five top teen addictions. That'll be fun tomorrow. But, um, uh, it's that like, we just tried to do to just still be present as we could. Yeah. Yeah. And then once the the challenge was, is that exit, the exit school program, the tour portion was such a massive thing and yeah. schools started doing, you know, rotations where this day, this class would go and the next day they wouldn't and that kind of sort of thing. 
And so Exit Tour, this kind of large scale program just became unfeasible. Um, and so we were doing this small scale school ministry. I was trying to help launch that in some other countries into Sci Venture, but a lot of other countries were far stricter than, than Ukraine was. Um, and so we, that it, it just became language intensive, you know, where we just really tried to bolster our Ukrainian and uh, local church ministry, um, and then as much national ministry as possible. So kind of a lot of this, like most of our school ministry became really small scale. I would, I would go okay. into the schools and teach English and things like that, but none of this kind of, none of those big like events big that production. we were doing yeah. pre-COVID. Exactly. Yeah. Well, cool. So post COVID now you're, you're sort of in the, the throes of the conflict. And so help us understand, you know, how that's impacted your ministry um, and what's really going on. Yeah. So when, uh, when Russia invaded again in February 24th of, of uh, last year, um, you know, 2022, that we were here, we were here in Lviv and it was early. It was like five in the morning or something like that. Um, I remember waking up super early, didn't look at my phone, had a, I had a great morning with the Lord. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we were having for the last probably month to two months leading up to the war, we were having kind of daily, all of the second culture staff. So we have a, we have at that point, we had, I think seven American units and one Czech family that we were meeting daily on zoom in the morning, like early in the morning, just to talk through everything. Like we were getting, I was, I got a couple of calls from the state department in the weeks leading up to, you know, the invasion, just saying like, Hey, are you staying? Why aren't you leaving? You know, where are you located? Sign up for this thing so we can help you if you need it. And so there was just obviously a lot going on just with Russia kind of posturing on the borders. Yeah. And then that morning, I remember that um, we all met on zoom and then um you know, and then they were telling, they were all sharing with me, even my wife was, had looked and seen these images of, you know, tanks crossing the border, you know, uh, just, just devastation Air, airports had all, had all gotten attacked with, with, uh, missiles. And then, you know, air raid siren starts in our city. And, uh, that was kind of like, okay, like this, we have a decision to make now we had, you know, a go bag. Our, our car was full. Our car actually has you know, uh, uh, unleaded fuel and natural gas tanks. And they're both totally full. Like I would always keep them full so we could drive like to Spain, you know, if we needed to. Right. Um, right. So it was, it was, um, we were ready, but when that happened, it was like, oh no, what do we do? So we, we, we started packing um, and our Ukrainian teammates that actually they, are from the east and they moved, you know, um, initially in 2014, um, and they recommended that all foreigners leave the country because at okay. that point, I mean, early on, you didn't just didn't know what to expect. You know, if yep. Russia invades and they occupy, you know, you become a potential bargaining chip or whatever for the Russian army or for the Russian government to use. And so there was just we were advised to leave. Yeah, that was that was. Um, that was a really, that was, you know, we never, even though everything was happening, you know, around Ukraine, like they were posturing and, and, you know, threatening invasion and all this. Like I have a video, I have a Marco Polo I sent to one of my, my friends in America on February 23rd, just of me in city center in Lviv, just being like, see, life is normal here. Like everyone's freaking out, yeah. you know, yeah. every, everything's, you know, everything's <clears throat> fine. And then the next morning, you know, we're, we're driving out of the country, you know, I was calling, calling the guys at Disciple calling our pastor of our local church. And, and I remember this conversation I had with the pastor of our local church. Like he, like, he was just like, you guys were great missionaries. Like he essentially said goodbye, you know, assuming that we would, we would be gone for good. You know, yeah. um, it was just, it was just such a foggy moment where you just didn't know what right. was going to happen. And it was that week at a international meeting. I had had that week. One of our, one of my teammates that lives in the Czech Republic, um, he had offered like, Hey, if something happens, you just have, you have a place to stay here. So I like, you know, I called him on that drive, like, Hey, we're coming, man. <laughs> yeah. And hope so, you meant it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it, 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 he did. He did. But I guess yeah. you got, he did. He had a lot of people in his house that first week, um, including us, but it took, we were like, it was 13 hours at the border. 
um, you know, just, just standing there waiting to get out. And that was, that was one of the quickest on our team. We had some teammates that waited 60 hours just in a car in line, Oof. just trying to get out. Cause I mean, that was the, and it was like Poland up to that point, Poland had like very strict border crossing laws where you couldn't yeah. cross. Like it was just like, cause COVID like, like COVID sure. restrictions. Yeah. You could fly into the country, but you couldn't drive in at that point. And so it was just okay. like, you know, chaos where they were just like, okay, well, that doesn't, that's not a good law anymore. So that, that morning, uh, we left, we got to check the next morning at 5.00 AM check time. Um, I'd been awake for, you know, 24 hours or whatever. And our, the president of our organization, I was one of the first of our teammates to get out. Um, and so our president of our organization calls me and says, Hey, we're meeting tonight. We want to talk strategy. And I'm, you know, delirious. Like, I just, I don't know what my <laughs> right. life is anymore, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, of course, like I'll be there. And so that we really started that week, you know, sending buses in to evacuate people okay. full of humanitarian aid, getting humanitarian aid in. And so for those first, so from that moment, really, you know, late February, all the way up until late April, um, our whole Josiah Venture Ukraine team and a lot of the neighboring countries totally shifted their focus to war support, you know, humanitarian aid, uh, yes. receiving refugees. And honestly, dude, I've, I mean, that is the Protestant church, I think, in Ukraine yeah. in those months and, and, or, and even the first, even up until this point, uh, really, that's, I think some of the perception of the Protestant church began to change because of the response the church had both within Ukraine and outside of it. Um, I, I don't know that there was a single Protestant church that didn't have Ukrainian refugees living in it in all of the neighboring, you know, in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, yeah. Central Ukraine, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Germany, all the way up to, you know, the Balkans. And it, it was just absolutely incredible to see the church truly come together and unify to help their brothers and sisters in need. And yeah. it was actually interesting. One of the things that we talked about was, you know, Czech Republic is kind of a stark opposite of Ukraine. It has, it's one of the most atheistic um, contexts in, in Europe. And they've just, you know, they've been in the center of a couple of world wars. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons for people to not understand <laughs> what's happening, you know? Right. Um, right. And so it was almost, it's like, Oh, there's this orth like a lot of, orthodox christians coming 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 west um you know is that can you know so we were just praying that god would use this terrible thing to you know expand his movement yeah. and i think i do think the protestant church was able to i know for us in ukraine our josiah ukraine team because we just i mean because josiah kept working and our all of our ukrainian teammates uh save a couple a couple families a couple of women and kids stayed in ukraine so we had people do okay. you know we would send humanitarian aid in our ukrainian teammates would receive it and then they would be the ones distributing it to local churches and it was all happening through local churches you know christian volunteers the people driving the food to the front line areas they're youth pastors they're youth workers they're these volunteers yeah. that they want to help they want to they want to be the hands and feet of jesus and they're literally you know going um to the front lines and and um delivering you know physical aid but also we we talked about this kind of two-handed approach where we wanted to also provide for spiritual needs too yeah and there are churches close to the front lines now that had you know a few dozen members before the war that have now hundreds of people like people will line up you know an hour before service because they want to get a seat and so yeah. i do think that you know when there's a clear evil when there's a clear need and there's a you know people that are meeting that that clear need um you know, obviously that's going to impact people's hearts. And yeah. so, um, so for those first months, it was all kind of humanitarian aid and refugees. I mean, it was okay. as much as we could get in and as many yep. as we could get out. I think we ended up, uh, I, I was in charge of, uh, organizing the buses along with, um, two teammates, two, two, uh, my teammate Lisa, and my team, Elena here, and we evacuated 3,280 people and found them like, those are people we got to, like we would bring them into our, to, we have the hotel that you stayed at yep, um, when yep. we had our classes in Czech Republic. That was one of our yeah. hubs. And we had another hub okay. not far down the road in Poland. 
So those were full of just Ukrainians, you know, and we yeah. would be there to greet them in their home lane, you know, in the Ukrainian language. Some people had a place, had family somewhere that they could get to, and we'd help them, yeah. we'd help get them there for free, give them some cash, you know, to to help help get them there. Some people came and they only had they had their backpack, they had their suitcase, they'd lost everything, you know, they left eastern Ukraine and yeah. they have nowhere to go. And so we would right. find them. There would be, you know, a local church would take them in, a family would take them in. So that's what we were doing. And it was, I mean, it was, you know, it was 18 hour days. I mean, it was just insane, dude. It was intense, yeah, yeah. you know, and when you're, you, you know, get home, you just check the news, you know, you're just, are, are my friends? Okay. You know, what's going on here. And so it was just kind of this, I got into a really, a really unhealthy, you know, rhythm of uh, just, you know, not sleeping much, just, you know, so much, I mean, it just, you want to help, right. you know, and buses, buses would, Across the border and the drivers would be calling me at two in the morning be like hey where am i going you know so it's just chaos man it was chaos right. and then we had a organization does a, an annual spring conference in the beginning of may okay so leading up to that that was kind of like the pivot point for our team uh where some of our some of our folks that were here went back into ukraine immediately following that conference my wife and i and our two kids we went to america for three for three weeks to raise money for our ukrainian teammates okay. um and then coming home from that trip to america we we moved back to ukraine that was june 3rd okay. of uh okay. 2022 so about when was that be that'd be march april may so about four months after the start of the war uh three three months and some change after the start of the war we moved back to lviv ukraine and have been okay. here ever since and so you started kind of back easing back into your more normal ministry endeavors right um what are you seeing that's different? Like, how are people feeling different? Because I know a lot of this migration you're talking about, the refugees are coming east to west, right? And so right. there's there are some cultural differences that I know you and I talked about, we were there in class, that are kind of influencing things, but also just, you know, the dynamic you talked about, the Protestant church now has shown up, right? Mm -hmm. And and shown up in for a sure. way that they didn't have to, there's no, there's nothing in it for them. Right. And so right. it sort of starts to diffuse some of those maybe objections that it's like, well, these people are only out for money. Well, not when they're sending food and buses and to people who have nothing that can pay them. All right. right. So, yeah. What's the new dynamic like? How new is it? Great I question. Guess? Yeah, it's for us, you know, because just having to Ukraine, you know, there was uh, about half our team that uh, less than half our team probably left the country and more than half stayed. Because there was a constant presence and a constant, um, we were constantly trying to, uh, you know, serve, empower, and equip our local church partners. And and you know, there, this church would tell this other church about, you know, hey, just have in Ukraine is sending you. You need some aid, like call them; they'll get you a truck, a semi truck, or whatever. So our network of local churches that we worked with really expanded. Okay. And so I remember, you know, we had a we had our first like team zoom you know i don't even remember when this was it might have been april you know it's like months after the start so it's just you imagine you know we're all just running 100 miles an hour and then we stop and get on a zoom that was actually a week like you know ukraine part of the survival instinct is some some dark humor you know so there was a lot of laughter you know uh i don't know that other people would have been laughing you know if they had if they had been a fly on the wall there but it was a real sweet time to kind of just be back together as a team we hadn't been together you know in a long time yeah um and I remember just all, our team just kind of was just refocusing and our team leaders did an incredible job. Ben and Christy Williams did an unbelievable job just kind of assign, like being able to um, understand needs and just kind of say, okay, here's a group of people that can do, like you'll be responsible for, you know, organizing trauma renewal retreats um, or you'll be, you'll be communicating with these support, with these um, churches, you'll be doing this. And then churches, it it's like, end of may and all these churches start contacting us and like and asking us hey are you guys still doing camps this summer <laughs> and we were like we weren't planning on it like we didn't yeah. think that was going to be a thing at all and um we ended up organizing 13 camps uh and and all everything just adventure does is through the local church so this is yeah. empowering 13 churches to do you know to do youth camps and it was and that you have to understand that was i think the most we had ever done in ukraine huh. and so That's it crazy. was just yeah absolutely and that was that was in 2022 when the war the year the war started the summer the war started this summer we did 
double that. And so ministry is just booming. That's the bad word to use. Ministry is, is really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely enlarging in, in, in an unbelievable way. I think, you know, when there's, again, when there's great need and there's people trying to offer to, to meet those needs as, as best yeah. they can, you know, I think, um, a lot of youth teams are broken, you know, youth pastors are, are gone serving in the front lines or yeah. delivering aid, you know, or half the team, you know, some of the team has left the country. And so when you kind of, when the dust settles, you realize, man, we need help. Like we don't have the same capacity that we had before. Oh, there's yeah. this youth or organization that does, that equips youth teams for, for ministry. Oh, they have some resources that they can help us, you know, supplement, you know, camp scholarships for, for some of our young people. Um, yeah. you know, and so I think just because by the grace of God, and this is, again, this is all through local churches in, you know, rest of Europe, but this is also local churches, churches and individuals across the world that are sending fin finances that are asking how they can help that are coming and doing what they can. So the fact that we had financial resources, but then also that our team was able to be present again, you know, we were all almost, almost our entire team was back on the ground in Ukraine that summer, um, and so kind of the unthinkable almost happened where, you know, ministry is just abs has literally probably tripled or quadrupled because the need is greater, you know, and like what Jesus talked about, you know, the workers are fewer, I would say now, you know, there are some organizations that have left and, and, and unfortunately they, they, you know, um, there, there's just fewer, fewer workers, you know, yeah. uh, both foreign and domestic, there's fewer Ukrainians, um, you know, unfortunately, that's due partially due to the fact that a lot of men are and and women are serving on the front lines. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have passed, have have perished because of of the war, and people have also left. You know, people um, families are separated, so it's just really hard to to quantify the need, and so um, that our team is present and that our the rest of our JV team, you know, the other countries, the other staff have supported. People have visited. You know, European churches have come on short-term teams. You know, we've been able to, by the grace of God, somehow be able to try to help, you know, serve, empower, and equip these local yeah. churches that are still trying to do, you know, incredible youth work um, in the midst of, you know, excruciating and, and challenging circumstances. That's pretty fantastic, man. I mean, it sounds like it's a challenging ministry, obviously, but uh, hopefully a rewarding one. And, um, you know, getting more involved with the broader network of churches is only going to open up opportunities, you know, after the I war know. and after all this settles down. But I mean, I think it's fantastic that you all are there just doing the hard work right now. Um, if, if folks wanted to check out Josiah venture or check out your ministry in particular, where would you, mm -hmm. where would you send them? Yeah. Um, you can go to our website, josiahventure.com. Um, if you want to read about Katie and I's ministry, in Ukraine, you can just put a, a slash Humerian, H-U-M-E-R-I-A-N. Um, and, you know, uh, our one of our, our social, me social media manager, Gwen, does a phenomenal job hosting our podcast as well. She has some great stories on there. She has stories with, um, you know, even if you wanted to hear more about, you know, Josiah Mitchell's work during the, the beginning of the war or just, you know, and kind of a whole spectrum of things. Those are those are awesome ways to connect. Any social cool. media, just Sia Venture. Um, that's the way to to connect. Nice. We'll put. We'll, I'll make sure we get some of that in the show notes, and um, just encourage everybody to take a look at this. I mean, I know we've got uh, Israel going on right now, uh, and so uh, over in the so states, brutal. you know, um, Ukraine has taken a bit of a backseat to Israel at this point, but. Um, obviously still going on. Obviously the church still stepping yeah. up, obviously a lot of needs still there. And so, um, we want to make sure we get the word out about it and, uh, and keep, keep folks kind of in the loop about what's happening Amen. in Ukraine. So Lee, thanks for being here, man. Um, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I know it's probably, I don't even know what time it is over there. Um, but almost I 10 know PM. So not, not, there too you bad. go. So not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> Uh, I knew it wasn't two in the afternoon, but I wasn't sure what time it was. So <laughs> thanks for taking the time, bro. Really appreciate it. And uh, everybody um, check out some of these links in the show notes where you can connect and look at what Josiah Ventures is doing and, uh, and be prayerful about uh, the folks who are working over in Ukraine, but also be prayerful about how you might um, help out in Ukraine. So thanks, mm -hmm. Lee. And I uh, really you, appreciate James. being here and we'll have to, we'll have to do it again sometime. I would love that, man.
It was a privilege. Thank you, man. All right, man. Take care. See you.